do get there, but this deck is very fast and very powerful. Why only two Berserks? I mean, it could be like an availability issue. Maybe. Pretty. I mean, pretty expensive card. I mean, are they good? Are they good if you draw multiple copies? Yeah, that's the whole reason they're overpowered. The second copy is twice as good as the first copy. But you need a pump spell to go with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like. Oh, you're saying because it's infect and they already have double strike. The X, you know, quad, you know, they already. It's already quadruple strike. So like having octuple strike is a little excessive. I just say that Berserk needs a pump spell to go along with it. Like in theory. Like, 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 not always, but okay, it's like, if you're attacking with, like, a Blight Agent, you Berserk, it deals two, and then the next Berserk deals four, which, or, you're dealing four total, which is fine, but, like, it's not that exciting. That's true. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I'm just, like, not that excited by that. Like, I could certainly see a bunch of hands... No, that, you're not wrong. You I, should be excited or not excited about whatever naturally excites or does not excite you. I could see hands with multiple Berserks being bad. Yeah. They, like, for instance, if they didn't have any Jace the Mind Sculptors in them. That's correct. Longmore is going to play an island here. Morris Lent did begin with just a Tropical into a Noble Hierarch. Already does have an Ink Moth Nexus, so that's the first Infect creature, and there's a Sylvan Library. Now, one thing here for Longmore, this is a very difficult matchup. Does not get the appropriate amount of time to get everything set up. Now, here's a Glistener Elf as well. It just seems like this deck has four Vines of the Vastwood and four Invigorates. If you draw two of those things, you do nine. But if you draw one in a Berserk, you're like, yeah. <laughs> Force of Will removing a Flusterstorm will take care of the Glistener Elf. Longmore going to take a draw here. A expert with High Tide has won an open in 2012 in Seattle with this deck. Going to go brainstorming here. Time to put a couple cards back. Did make top eight when we were in Providence a few weeks ago as well before being dispatched. Here's a land by Combo Elves via Ross Merriam. Going to play an island with Longmore before passing the turn back. Morris Lent will activate the Sylvan Library. Looking at a Ponder of Vines of the Vastwood and a Glistener Elf. Going to pay 8 life right away. Something we don't see, in my opinion, enough players do with Sylvan Library. Yeah, I mean, once you're, uh, once you're up against High Tide, I mean, you might as well just go ahead and get your, your Ancestral Recall on. Sylvan Library, absolutely incredible against Preacherless decks. Let's reprint that. Can we, can we get that in M15? Nope. <laughs> Misty Rainforest is going to get sacrificed. More, more slant going to go down to 10. Sylvan Library would be a real nice way to just punish blue-white decks. <laughs> sure hope you got a D aside. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's what Underworld Connections is. I want Library, and I want Rashad and Port back. That's it. That's it? You just want Rashad and Port back? Yeah. Rashad, just, Rashad. Just a land. Yeah. Yeah, well, so is Tolarian Academy and Library <laughs> Alexandria. <laughs> just, just taps for mana. I don't see the big deal. Tropical Island, the card search for it there. It doesn't just tap for mana. It also stone rains your opponent every so often. That's cool. Here comes the Ikmoth Nexus. The Exalted Trigger is going to make the attack for two. I bet you like Armageddon, don't it's you? It's like my third favorite magic card. You, you're, the, you're totally the Armageddon type. Yeah, I am. And I'm hoping they reprint one very soon. Yeah. Well, As I've said many times, it should cost white, 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 white. But yeah, I would like to see Armageddon come back. Yeah, well, hopefully you'll get a Thoughts of Ruin someday. <laughs> Armageddon. That's magic right there. Armageddon. They get to play for a little bit, and they don't get to play anymore. That's cool for me. You deserve to be stasis locked. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on anyone. People who, you know who plays Armageddon? Anybody when it's legal, but. <laughs> besides that, besides that. All right, so we've got Invigorate on the Ink Moth Nexus. I mean, it's for six right now. Yeah, which is no jokes. And I think there's a Vines of the Vastwood over there. But it looks like Chris did not want to move in, maybe? And yeah, he's just going to play a Ponder post-combat. Because he has Vines of the Vastwood and the ability to use it, but doesn't want to get it countered. It can pick a better spot, I think, knowing that he's not going to die in the next turn. I kind of like the whole playing around Spell Pierce thing. Yeah, I'm good with that. I mean, I'm sure that Chris or knows... Or Storm, I guess. Yeah. I know that Chris knows he's up against High Tide. Longmore did live in the Seattle area, plays a lot of Legacy up here. There's a Glistener Elf. And again, High Tide isn't a deck that can go off very easily on turn three. It's a turn four deck. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit of a challenging matchup for High Tide. You know, obviously High Tide's got a lot of tools and some, some interaction, and the Infect deck is not the most consistent. However, generally speaking, the Infect deck's game plan just matches up better against High Tide. It's just faster, and uh, High Tide lacks meaningful interaction. So let's see what Longmore wants to do on the third turn of the game here. I think this might be a counterbalance. Potentially, we'll see. Two mana's being tapped. This is going to be a Merchant Scroll. That's going to resolve, so it's time to go searching for a blue instant. We'll see which one's going to be. Oftentimes, it is high tide here. Could also be Force of Will. Those are the decisions that Longmore is making. Classic double Demonic Tutor. Yeah, can't get both. Can only get one. Of course, the question is which one will be searched for. And it's going to be high tide. I've always been a big fan of this deck. It's just a really cool deck to see in action. It's a unique way to kill people. Running them out of cards? But you do it in, like, a grandiose fashion. That's what I like. You're doing it with all this blue mana and these blue cards. Look, you're into Fleece Main Lion. I'm into running people out of cards and casting Armageddon. All right? To each their own. This here's a Noble Hierarch pre-combat. A Pendlehaven activation is going to make that into a 2-3. Then two Exalted triggers will make this an attack for four. It only takes ten Infect to get the job done. Brain Freeze is real original, man. You know, thank you. All right, so we go to game two. Uh, the sideboard... This is where the, uh, the Cunning Wish deck pays a little bit of a price. Longmore has a sideboard that is dedicated to one-ofs to make the main deck Cunning Wish... Uh, much stronger. The only uh, the only extra cards being Wipeaways and Swan Songs, neither of which is at its best in this matchup. I wouldn't be surprised to see Swan Song come in just because it's kind of a desperate times, desperate measures kind of thing, yeah. where you may just have to counter invigorate. And truth be told, if you do give your opponent a two-two bird, yeah, Longmore's life total you know, ended that game at twenty-two, so won't be that really that big of a deal, I don't think. Right. On the other side here for Morris Lent, and already a very favorable matchup. There are two Fluster Storms, two Pivot Needles, a Repeal, a Nature's Claim, a Viridian Corruptor, a Caracas, a Pajuka Bog, a Force of Will, a Tower of the Magistrate. Haven't seen that for a while. Two Dismember and two Stifle. Uh, Fluster Storm is good in this matchup, naturally. Pivot Needle is good against Sensei's Divining Top and Candelabra of Taunos, even though Chris didn't see any of those in the first game. If he follows the Open Series and Feline, probably used to seeing those. The rest of the cards, really not all that exciting. Nature's Claim could be okay. The Force of Will can be okay. Um, I actually don't think that Stifle's good against this deck because once it's going off, there's really no way to stop it. And Stifle doesn't even necessarily stop their win condition as they don't have to kill you with Brain Freeze. And oftentimes when Longmore kills you, it's by decking you with Blue Sun Zenith, which is cooler than Brain Freeze, Patrick. Okay? Because it's like for 50-something. So there. Yeah? Yeah. That's cool. Unless you have a 600-some card deck, like you talked about earlier. Well, it still works, because every turn you just draw the Blue Sun Zenith and then Blue Sun Zenith them again. Over So was that over. the problem with the deck? They had Stroke of Genius. Blue Sun Zenith hadn't been printed. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the, the thing I like is this Tower of the Magistrate thing. Tower of the Magistrate is an unappreciated answer to equipment. I mean, it does a variety of things, but the ability to give your opponent's creature protection from artifacts to cause its equipment to, uh, to not actually work out. Very, very fun, particularly against things like Batter Skull Germs. That's why I love Legacy, is because interactions like that, that are just off the wall. Somehow Tower of the Magistrate, a card that, when it was printed, I imagine had a use in mind. Well, it's funny because on the surface it looks like it's supposed to be giving things protection from artifacts, but historically that hasn't been the primary functionality. Yeah. Its main use was actually with Cowardice. If you had Cowardice in play, it was an enchantment that, for five mana that made it so that whenever a creature was the target of a spell or ability, it would bounce to its owner's hand. Mercadian Mass. Right. Yes. Mercadian Mass block, yeah. So if you use Tower of the Magistrate on your opponent's creatures, you could actually lock them out. You could keep targeting your opponent's creature and then bouncing it because, you know, well, in short, cowards can't block warriors. That's just true. So this was a deck? That was a deck. David Williams was uh, one of the uh, the pioneers of this one. There's a number of other people. I don't recall everybody who who played these sorts of decks at the time, but um, Cowardice, uh, in conjunction with uh, Tower of the Magistrate, was kind of a sick little 
sickle Romano combo. They even had stuff like Rashad and Cut Purse. He's uh, two and a blue for a one one. When you would play, when he enters the battlefield, your opponent has to sacrifice a permanent unless they pay a mana. Okay. So sometimes your opponent would just tap out on turn two, and then you just cut purse him and just taste it, you know. But the nice thing is that with the cut purse, you can keep bouncing it, you know, so you can abuse the synergies more often. <laughs> Mass was just a different time, which is it's so awesome. Yeah. I was playing with. Uh, there's a gentleman who lives in the Providence area. His name is Brian Swatkins. A gentleman. Absolutely. He is a gentleman, trust me. Uh, the reason I know this is because he has 30 old standard decks. Yeah. Like the oldest of the old decks. Yeah. So, you know, and you, he has a 30 sided die, and you just roll a die, and each deck is obviously correlated to a number. And you just do battle. Yeah. So, you know, like the last time I was with them when we were in Providence, I rolled a seven, and I got the Rising Waters deck. Yeah, how's that? That, uh, you know, had Ribbon Snake yeah. and Crew. And he rolled like a two, and he just had blue green madness. Yeah. So he played a basket root wall, and I just died or whatever. So <laughs> can't get it off the table. But during those days, during Mask and Nemesis, when Rising Waters was a big thing to be doing, those creatures were really bad, real bad. Yeah, like, it was laugh out loud funny bad. Yeah, like one of the one of the uh, one of the stone cold killers in the Rising Waters deck, which is a pro tour winning deck. Mind yes. You. Yes. One of the uh, one of the all stars is two and a blue for a 1-3 flyer that once per turn you can pay a blue mana to give it plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Just the one time. Get it up to a two power for three <laughs> if you pay mana. A Noble Hyrax to start things off here for CML. Feline Logmore is going to play a top and an island. We'll see if there's a counterbalance to follow up. There's not. Just a flooded strand. What's the name of that card? The 1-3? Do you know? What is it like? Uh, it had two different names. Uh, Azimat Drake or something. Some kind of Drake. Um, but it had two different names at different points because they reprinted it. Fun they had a, they did a function, uh, functional reprint. So good they brought it back. Yeah. You can pay one to make it a 2-3 just this once. I mean, it's actually a totally fine card. It would be, you know, I would totally draft the hell out of that card. <laughs> Spinning at the top here. The it's not is a quite as good as Night Vale Spectre. Yes, a few things are. Night Vale Spectre requiring, uh, instead of having, you know, instead of a mana to use, it instead just draws you a card off your opponent's deck every turn. <laughs> this will be a brainstorm response to the top here for Chris. Wants to get use out of that card. Oh, there it is. Oh, what do you know? As Matt Drake. Hmm. Well, I'm not surprised if you're right. What did I tell everyone when we were in Richmond? What did I tell everybody? I have no idea. Don't play I mental magic against there. you. Oh. So, as Matt Drake. Uh, not the name, when it was reprinted though, I believe it had a different name when it was reprinted in Mask Block though. Uh, you can't play Mental Magic Engine, you can't play, I think it's 20 questions? When you're thinking of a card, like you think of a card and you just ask all the cards. To figure, I do know that. If you ever want to get anybody, and I probably shouldn't tell everybody this, but if you ever want to get anybody, okay. Smoke is the, it is the Widowmaker. Nobody ever, <laughs> nobody in the history of the world has ever gotten Smoke correctly. Uh, well, in the context of, I'm actually trying to think of what smoke does now. I know it's a red enchantment. I think it costs red, red. I have no idea what the text is. Uh, Lent, fetching, trying to figure out how to navigate this counterbalance top little uh, interaction here. Yeah, making it a perfect brainstorm with that fetch land. Yeah, smoke is, it's like, a, it's like the red winter orb. It's red, red, okay. enchantment from alpha. Uh, players may not untap more than one creature per turn. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite good with, like, for instance, Icy Manipulator or whatever, you know, in your Icy Manipulator Royal Assassin Black Red Board Control <laughs> tap deck. But, uh, no, Smoke is the best. The only other one that can compare to Smoke is Power Surge. But I think Smoke is slightly better if people have not, you know, if, if they've never seen this before. If you're ever playing 20 questions with your friends, you know, on a car ride to a PTQ or something, if they weren't listening today, foolishly enough, yep. get them with Smoke. Part of what makes it so good Okay, and we do see a Blighted Agent. Well, the Counterbalance. The Merchant Scrolls are going to take on that. So part of what makes Smoke so good is that uh, Alpha had so many cards that cost red, red. Like a shocking number, like rage, you know, enchantments. And people would think about things like Raging River or Power Surge or whatever. Um, and they, they, you can often trip them up with things like Fork. The point being, though, that after the people use enough questions to figure out that you're talking about an Alpha card and that it's red, and that it's rare, they still get completely just, you know, that it costs two. They get blown out. Plus, what ends up actually happening is they outthink it, and they end up picking things. They, they, they start forgetting, and they think things like giant strength. Oh, no. 
Invigorate is pretty hot. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but Blue Sun Zenith off a reveal of Countervail is a little hotter. Wow. Gonna that's take care of that. This is only gonna be an attack for two poisons instead of six. Yeah, the thing though, I mean, it, at this point, Longmore basically has spells completely locked up. Lent is just gonna try to ride this Glistener Elf to victory over the course of the next four turns. The reveal there was insane. That's a one of Blue Sun Zenith, of course, and there are not a lot of threes. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's got Cunning Wish, but that's about it, you know? Literally just three Cunning Wishes and one Blue Sun Zenith that has been cyborged in. But no, I'm telling you, man, people end up, they, they start going on a tilt. They start thinking things like Giant Strength is somehow in Alpha when it's not, <laughs> it's from Legends. But they start, you know, like, Nobody, the smoke is not a card that most people are familiar with. Longmore's gonna spin the top here. Goes up to four in fact. Just looking to put together high tide plus times for already has the high tide in hand. Of course has to work through counter magic a little bit, but this is why top plus counter balance is in the deck. The idea here is to buy yourself enough time to be able to go off. And of course, when you are trying to go off, well, you can counter most of their permission that interacts with you. Soul Net's another good one. I know that card. I'm never guessing. I have the art of Soulnet in my head yeah. right now. The art is very iconic. Yep. Either Soul, either Soulnet or Iron Star, or like uh, I know maybe, that one too. Yeah, either. I mean, Crystal Rod's also not bad, but everybody thinks of that one. You played this game a lot. Haven't you? See, a lot of people don't realize a lot of the strategy to coming up with these is either you pick some obscure card that nobody's ever heard of, or you pick a card that has a lot of the same attributes as other cards in the same set, so that people end up having to waste tons of questions trying to deduce which exact one it is. You know, like when, e even once you figured out that it's a one casting cost uncommon artifact from Alpha that lets you gain life, you're not even close. There's so many of them, you know. Time to put those cards back. Now we. In and we take a draw. There are two high tides over there, and there is one mystery foil card. Longmore is at eight, in fact. Can reset, of course, with the polluted delta. She'd like to. But right now, another attack here. It's going to put it on the eight. Put her update, in fact. There's only two left to go. The clock is very real. We're casting a high tide within a turn. Okay. Angus McKenzie's another good one. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> That sounds like an artist for a card. A lot of people just play with the rule you can't just name cards from Legends. Like, that's just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> that's Angus A-N... A-N-G-U-S. Yeah, Angus. okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, dude. I've never even seen that before. No, nah, it's a real thing. <laughs> All Go right. Ahead. So what happened here is High Tide resolves. Yep. Islands are tapping for two. Draw the card with the top. I imagine that's the Blue Sun Zenith that Longmore knows is there. And now the goal, I think, I believe now, is to cast the Blue Sun Zenith for a bunch, draw a bunch of cards, and try to go off next turn. Well, I mean, this is, lethal is on the table right now. Yeah, no, so this is all happening in Morrisland's end step. Oh, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, after he, he takes a two, goes up to eight, in fact, and now the goal is, okay, I need to resolve the Blue Sun Zenith because I don't have what I need to go off. So... This is going to be a Zenith here for two, four, six, eight. So it'll be for five, I believe. Was there any mana floating? There yep. was not, right? One for the high tide. The other one's here for the blue sun Zenith. That'll be eight mana. Minus three for the initial casting cost. X is five. Will Morris let this resolve? Actually, X is four? With one floating. Oh, one floating. Okay, sure. I like that. Oh, I know. Okay. And the other card. So the, other, the two it's cards. For, yeah, keeping. I mean, this is game two. So I think she wants to keep up uh, Flusterstorm to make sure. her hand. Yep. Protecting against uh, any sort of possible counter magic out of the uh, Infect deck. I like that, not being overly greedy. All right, so four cards coming, that's going to shuffle back in. Now, of course, these four cards are going to be pretty good because, again, Longmore is facing Lethal next turn. That's why they're going to be pretty good. Yeah, they, they had better be pretty good. We know there's a high tide over there. It looks like a couple lands were Three drawn. Three islands and Ugh. a high tide? Yike. Those weren't great. Let's have an untap with five lands in play. Take a draw. Another island? Ugh. Long more find anything to do anything with. Maybe we're seeing the hand incorrectly. Play an island. This looks like it's going to be a high tide. There's a top. Now there's a high tide. So you're playing top first? Yeah, just to set up the counterbalance yep. to ensure that... Uh, that it resolves, willing to waste the mana in order to uh, have a little bit of insurance. I'm not sure if this is a situation where you can waste the mana, though. That's the real concern, I think. Because if you play high tide first, then you can play top and spin it with the mana, 
And now he actually, now Longmore has to use a mana to spin it. So it's a little inefficient. And I'm not sure if, given that you're facing lethal and you don't really have the opportunity in the cards in your hand to maybe waste mana in this situation. We'll see if it comes back to Biter or not. Waste but. or invest? Tough to say. Tough to say. Cup half empty or half full? Uh, dude, how can anybody ever, you know, how can a cup be half empty or half full when it's always overflowing? <laughs> High tide will resolve. Islands are going to be tapping for two. Longmore's already played land for the turn, so now there's one blue mana floating. It's time to spin. There's a counterbalance, an island, and I'm not too sure what that card is on top, but it goes on top very quickly. Going to activate top and draw a card. It may be, oh my, it is a time spiral. Okay. Is that good? If so, why? This is a time spiral with a blue mana floating. <laughs> That's a fluster storm. And this is a fluster storm. Fluster storm, one of the best answers to fluster storm. Why not? Yeah, I was going to say, you also, you do want to top and uh, counterbalance and the reveal the top the okay, just to sure. counter one of them. But. Sure. Morris Lentz. Is he going to be able to pay for some of these? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think this is... I mean, Longmore needs to counter the original copy. Okay. But um, they're still going to end up with... Uh, Lent is going to be able to pay for... for three of the copies, so this isn't going to work out for mm -hmm. Longmore. I think Longmore was thinking, well, I just fluster storm all your fluster storms, so you can't pay for them. Now, has Morris Lent play paid for his original fluster storm is the question. So you pay one blue, and now these fluster storms are all targeting fluster storms. I think he'll be able to pay for enough of them to still be able to counter time spiral potentially. Ah, yes, his lands do tap for two blue as well. Yeah, because of High Tide being a symmetrical high, effect. High Tide is a cruel, cruel mistress. You actually don't see that come up very often. The opponents, the opponents' islands tapping for two. I mean, quite it, a bit. it came up quite a bit back in the old PTQ season, way, way, way back. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a whole thing back then, but not a, not, not so common of a situation anymore. Particularly since these, the, you know, the counter spells these kids today are casting, they don't even freaking require mana. Was Hot Tide the best, the best deck during like its PTQ season? Yeah, it was the best deck during quite a number of seasons, okay. particularly when um, uh, immediately after Pro Tour Rome. I mean, at Pro Tour Rome, nobody really played Thawing Glacier. The only people who played High Tide, you know, it was just a small contingent actually rooted out of Ohio. Jason Opalka and a bunch of... But the also king! Sped, but also uh, uh, a bunch of sped guys um, had uh, a lot of success with High Tide. And then uh, Eric Taylor and I uh, kind of went a more of a thawing glacier direction during the PTQ season, which ended up rapidly taking over. So what the players are doing right now is they are resolving all of these fluster storms. It can get a little bit complicated because this card has storm, and the fluster storms have to have targets. So I imagine there will be a little bit of a discussion here with the table spotter and the judge, but it's not going to work out the way the Longmore wants it to, as Morris Lent is able to pay for the fluster storms, counter the time spiral, and win the game. So Chris Morris Lent is going to win the match. Overfield and Longmore, two games to zero. In fact, taking down High Tide. And in fact, is a little too quick to take down High Tide. I'm not too surprised to see Chris win this one and move on to 4-0. Yeah, plus, I mean, outside of just being too quick, Flusterstorm is a total beat beating for, uh, for High Tide. I mean, yeah. Flusterstorm is just a ruthless, ruthless killer. So 